The Secret of Platform 13, Chapter 5. Goodness, isn't it? Grand, said Gerton Chew, looking at the house, which was as famous on the island as Buckingham Palace or the castle where King Arthur had lived with his knights. Gerkey was right. Trottle Towers was very grand. It had three stories and bristled with curly bits of plasterwork and bow windows and turrets on the roof. The front of the house was separated from the street by a stony garden with gravel paths and a high spiked gate. On the railings were notices saying, tradesmen not admitted, and it is strictly forbidden to park. And on the brickwork of the house were three burglar alarms like yellow boils. The back of the house faced the park, and it was from here that the rescuers had come. The ghosts had returned to the gum. Dawn was just breaking, but inside the house everything was silent and dark. Then, as they stood and looked, a light came on downstairs, deep in the basement. The room had barred windows and almost no furniture so that they could see who was inside as clearly as on a stage. A boy. A boy with light hair and a friendly, intelligent face. He was dressed in jeans and a sweater and he was working. On a low table, a row of shoes, shoes of all shapes and sizes, boots and ladies' high-heeled sandals and gentlemen's lace-ups and the boy was cleaning them. Not just rubbing a cloth over them but working in the polish with a will and as he worked, he whistled. They could just hear him through the open slit at the top of the window. And the rescuers turned to each other and smiled, for they could see that the prince had been taught to work, and he wasn't being brought up spoiled and selfish as they had feared. Something about the way the ghost had spoken about Raymond Trottle had worried them, but the boy's alert face, the willing way in which he polished other people's shoes, was a sign of the best possible breeding. This was a prince who would know how to serve others, as did his parents. The boy finished the shoes and carried them out. A second light went on and they saw him enter a scullery, fill a kettle, lay out some cups and saucers on a tray. This job too he did neatly and nimbly and Odd sighed for it was amazing how right she had been about the prince. He was just the kind of person she wanted for a friend and she held on even tighter to the suitcase, glad that she had brought him the best present that any boy could have. The scullery light went off and a light appeared between the crack in a pair of curtains which the boy now drew back. As he did this, they could see his face turn towards them. The straight light hair lapping the level brows, the wide set eyes and the pointed chin. Then he made his way to the bed and set the tray down beside a fierce looking lady who didn't seem to be thanking him at all, but just grabbed her tea. That must be Mrs Trotter, whispered Gertrude. She doesn't look very loving. The boy's task was still not done. Back in the scullery, he took out a mop and a bucket and began to wipe the floor. Was he perhaps working a little too hard for a child who had not yet had breakfast? Or was he on a training scheme? Knights often lived like this before a tournament, and boy scouts too. But nothing mattered except that the <coughs> prince was everything a boy should be, and that the day they brought him back to his rightful home would be the most joyous one on the island that was ever known. Can't we... Go and tell him we're here, asked Dodge. There was no need. The boy had come out of the back door carrying a polythene bag full of rubbish, which he put into the dustbin. Then he lifted his head and saw them. For a moment he stood perfectly still with a look of wonder on his face, and it was almost as though he was listening to some distant remembered music. Then he ran lightly up the basement steps and threw open the gate. Can I help you, he asked. Is there anyone you want to see? Craw the wise stepped forward. He wanted to greet the prince by his true name, to bow his head before him, but he knew he must not start on him, and trying to speak in an ordinary voice, though he was very much moved, he said, yes, there is someone we want to see, you. The boy drew in his breath. He looked at Gerky's round, kind face, at the grassy patch on the wizard's head, at Odge, who had turned shy and was scuffing her shoes. Then he sighed. You mean it? It's really me you've come to see. Indeed it is, my dear, said Gherkin Jude, and put her arm around him. He was too thin, and why hadn't Mrs Trottle cut his hair? It was bothering him, flopping over his eyes. The boy's next words surprised them. I wish I could ask you in, but I'm not allowed to have visitors, he said, and they could see how much he minded not being able to invite them into the house. But there's a bench there under the oak tree where you could rest, and I could get you a drink. No one's up yet. They wouldn't notice. We need nothing, said Craw, but let us be seated. We have much to tell you. 
They made their way back into the park and the boy took out his handkerchief and wiped his wooden slats with the seat clean. It was as though he was inviting them to this bench, even if he couldn't invite them to his house. <coughs> Nor would he himself sit down, but stood before them and answered their questions in a steady voice. You have lived all your life at Trottle Towers, asked Cor. Yes, a shadow spread for a moment over his face, as though he was looking back on a childhood that had been far from happy. And you have learnt to work, we can see that. But your schooling? Oh yes, I go to school. It's across the park in a different part of London. Very different, he thought. Swolbottle Junior was in a shabby street. The building was full of cracks and the teachers were often tired. But it was a good place to be. It was the holidays he minded, not the term. The ogre had managed to follow them to the bench with his eyes shut. But the prince's voice pleased him so much that he now opened it. Cor frowned at him. Gurky shook her head. They had been so careful not to startle the prince, and invisible ogles are unusual. There is nothing to be done about that. But the boy didn't seem at all put out by a single blue eye floating halfway up the trink trunk of the tree. <coughs> is he or she? I don't want to pry, but is this a friend of yours? Hans was introduced, and the visitors made up their mind. The prince was entirely untroubled by magic. It was as though the traditions of the island were in his blood, even if he hadn't been there since he was three months old. It was time to reveal themselves and take him back. Was that Mrs Trottle to whom you brought a cup of tea? asked Cor, because we have something to say to her. The boy smiled. Oh, goodness, no, he said. Mrs Trottle lives upstairs. That was the cook. Cor frowned. He was an old-fashioned man and a bit of a snob, and he did not think it absolutely right that a prince should have to take morning tea to the cook. But Dodge had had enough of talking. I brought you something, she said in her abrupt throaty liquor voice. A present, something nice. She put the suitcase down on the grass. The word Odge Gribble Hag had been printed <coughs> out. Instead, written this way up, handle with care. The boy crouched down beside her. He could hear the present breathing through the holes. Something alive, he thought, his eyes alight. It was at this moment that on the first floor of Trottle Towers, someone began to scream. All of them were used to the sound of screaming. Odge's sisters practically never stopped. Banshees wailed through the trees of the island, harpies yelled, and the sound of bull seals calling to their mates sometimes seemed to shake the rafters. But this was not that sort of scream. It was not the healthy scream of someone going about their business. It was a whining, self-pitying, blackmailing sort of scream. Odge refastened the catch of her suitcase in a hurry. Gherkin Tree put her arm around the prince, and the eye soared upwards as Hans got to his feet. What is it, dear boy? asked Gherkin, and put her free hand up on her head as though to protect the beetroot from the dreadful noise. Is it someone having an operation? said Cornelius. I thought you had anaesthetic. The boy shook his head. No, he said. It's nothing like that. It's Raymond. A terrible silence fell. What do you mean it's Raymond? asked Cor when he could speak again. Surely you are Raymond Trottle, the supposed son of Mr and Mrs Trottle. The boy shook his head once more. No, oh goodness no, I'm only the kitchen boy. I'm not anyone. My name is Ben. As he spoke, Ben moved away and stood with his back to the visitors. It was over then. It wasn't him they'd come to see. He'd been an idiot. When he'd seen them standing there, he'd such a feeling of homecoming, as though at last the years of drudgery were over. It was like that dream he'd had sometimes, the dream with the sea in it and soft green turf and someone whose face he couldn't see clearly but he knew wanted him. Only dreams were things you woke up from and he should have known that it was not him but Raymond the visitors had come to find. Everything had always belonged to Raymond. All his life he'd been used to Raymond living upstairs with everything he wished for and parents to dote on him. Raymond's had cupboards and cupboards full of toys. He never even looked up at, m at them and more clothes than he knew what to do with. He was driven to this posh school in a Rose Rolls Royce and just to tear the wrapping paper from his Christmas pre presents took Raymond hours. And so far, Ben hadn't minded. He was used to living with the servants, used to sleeping in the windowless cupboard and working for his keep. You couldn't envy Raymond, who was always whining and saying, I'm bored, but this was different. That these strange, mysterious, interesting people belonged to Raymond and not to him was almost more than he could bear. You sure he isn't being tortured? asked Cor as the screams went on. Quite sure. He often does it. Often? 
said the wizard and shook out his ear trumpet in case he'd misheard. Ben nodded. Whenever he doesn't want to go to school, probably he hasn't done his homework. I usually do it for him, but I couldn't yesterday because I was visiting my grandmother in hospital. Who is your grandmother? Orange wanted to know. She's called Nanny Brown. She used to be Mrs. Trottle's nanny, and she still lives here in the house in the basement. She adopted me when I was a baby because I didn't have any parents. What happened to them? Ben shrugged. I don't know. They died. Mr. Fulton thinks that they must have been in prison because Nanny never mentions them. Talking about Nanny Brown was difficult because she was very ill. It was she who protected him from the bullying of the servants. Even the sno snooty butler, Mr. Fulton, respected her. And if she died, the rescuers were silent, huddled together on the bench. Hans had closed his eye and was covering his face with invisible hands. He was used to the silence of the mountains and felt a heartache, a headache coming on. Hodge was crouched under the suitcase as though to comfort what was inside. It was a child who was making that noise. The child they had come so far to find and the boy they liked so much had nothing to do with them at all. What is it, my angel? My baby kins my treasure, said Mrs Trottle coming into the room. She'd been making up her face when Raymond's screams began. Now her right cheek was covered in purple rouge and her left cheek was still a rather nasty grey colour. Mrs Trottle's hair was in curlers and she gave off a strong smell of man-eater because she was always went to bed covered in scent. Raymond continued to scream. Tell Mama, tell your mummy my pinky poo, begged Mrs Trottle. I've got a pain in my tummy, yelled Raymond. I'm ill. Mrs Trottle pulled back the covers on Raymond's huge bed with its padded headboard and the built-in switches for his television set, his two computers and his electric trains. She put a finger on Raymond's stomach and the finger vanished because Raymond was extremely fat. Where does it hurt, my petty kind? Which bit? Everywhere, screeched Raymond, all over. Since Raymond had eaten an entire box of chocolates the night before, this was not surprising. <coughs> but Mrs Trottle looked worried. I can't go to school, yelled Raymond, getting to the point. I can't. Raymond's school was the most expensive in London. The uniform, the uniform alone cost hundreds of pounds, but he hated it. Of course you can't, my lambkin, said Mrs Trottle, drawing her finger out of Raymond's middle. I'll send a message to the headmaster, and then I'll call a doctor. No, no, not the doctor. I don't want the doctor. He makes me worse, yelled Raymond. And indeed, the doctor was not always so kind to darling Raymond as he might have been. Mr Trottle now came in looking cross because he was sat in his portable telephone again and asked what was the matter. Ah, oh, little one is ill, said Mrs Trottle. You must tell Willard to drive to the school after he has dropped you at the bank and let them know. He doesn't look ill to me, said Mr Trottle, but he never argued with his wife. And anyway, he was in a hurry to go and lend a million pounds to a property developer who wanted to cover a beautiful Scottish island with holiday homes for the rich. Raymond's screams grew less. They became wailed, then snivels. I feel a bit better now, he said. I might manage some breakfast. He'd heard the car drive away and knew that the danger of school was safely passed. Perhaps a glass of orange juice, suggested Mrs Trottle. No, some bacon and some sausages and some fried bread, said Raymond. But darling, Raymond puckered up his face, ready to scream again. All right, all right, my little sugar plum. I'll tell Fulton and then a quiet day in bed. No, I don't want a quiet day in bed. I feel better now. I want to go to lunch at Fortlands and then shopping. I want a laser gun like Paul has at school and a knife and... But darling, you've already got seven different guns, said Mrs Trottle, looking at Raymond's room, which was completely strewn with toys, which he had pushed aside or broken or refused to put away. Not like the one Paul's got, not a sonic trigger, activated laser, and I want one, I want it. Very well, dear, said Mrs Trottle. We'll go to lunch at Fortlands. You do look a little rosier. This was true. Raymond looked very rosy indeed. People usually do when they have yelled for half an hour. And shopping, asked Raymond. Not just lunch, but shopping afterwards. And shopping, agreed Mrs Trottle. So now give your mumsy a great big sloppy kiss. That was how things always ended on days when Raymond didn't feel well enough to go to school. With Raymond and Mrs Trottle dressed to kill, eating to have, going to have lunch in London's grandest department store. The name of the store was Portland's and Marlowe. It was in Piccadilly and sold everything you could imagine. 
marble bathtubs and ivory elephants and sofas that you sank into and disappeared. It had a food hall with a fountain where butlers in hard hats bought cheeses which cost a week's wages and a bridal department where the daughters of duchesses were fitted with their wedding gowns. And none of the dresses had price stickers on them in case people fainted clean away when they saw how much they cost. And there was a restaurant with pink chairs and pink tablecloths in which Raymond and his mother were having lunch. I'll have shrimps and mayonnaise, said Raymond, and then I'll have roast pork with crackling and Yorkshire pudding, and I'm afraid the Yorkshire pudding comes with the roast beef, sir, said the waitress. With the pork, you get applesauce and red currant jelly. I don't like applesauce, whined Raymond. It's all squishy and gooey. I want Yorkshire pudding, and I want it now. It was at this moment that the rescuers entered the store. They, too, were having lunch in the restaurant. When Ben had told them how Raymond was going to spend the day, they decided to follow the prince and study him at a distance so that they could decide how best to make themselves known to him. Only I want Ben to come, Odd said. Everyone wanted Ben to come, but he said he couldn't. I don't have school today because they need the building for a council election and I promised my grandmother I'd come to the hospital at dinner time. But he said he would go with them as far as Portland and point Raymond out because the trottles had gone off in the rolls and no one had seen him yet. Hans, though, decided to stay behind. He didn't like crowded places and he lay down under an oak tree and went to sleep, which made a great muddle for the dogs, who didn't understand why they couldn't walk through a perfectly empty patch of grass. Gurky absolutely loved Fortland. The vegetable display was quite beautiful, the passion fruit and the pineapples and the cauliflowers arranged, and she had time to say nice things to a tray of broccoli, which looked lovely. In a different sort of shot, the rescuers might have stood out, but Fortland's was full of old-fashioned people coming up from the country, and they fitted in quite well. The only thing people did stare at a bit was the beetroot on Gurky's hat, so she decided to leave it in the fountain to soak quietly while she went up to the restaurant. It was as she was bending over the water to look for a place where, she where the beloved vegetable would not, would not be noticed that she saw beneath the water weed a small, sad face. Bending down to see more clearly, she found she had not been mistaken. Yes, it's me, said a slight silvery voice. Melissa's, I heard you were coming, and then, I'm not a mermaid, you know. I'm a water nymph. I've got feet. Yes, I know, dear. I can see you've got feet, but you don't look well. What are those marks on your arms? It's the queens. People chuck queens into the fountain all day long. Heaven knows why. I'm all covered in bruises and the water isn't changed nearly often enough. And her lovely tiny face really did look very melancholy. Why don't you come down with us, dear? whispered Gertrude. The gump's open. We could take you wrapped in wet towels. It wouldn't be difficult. I was going to, said Philip sadly. But not now. You've seen him. Prince, do you mean? We haven't yet. Well, you will in a minute. He's just gone up in the lift. There was a lot of us going, but who wants to be ruled by that? She then agreed to hide the beetroot under a water lily leaf, and Gurky hurried to catch up with the others. The nymph's word had upset her, but Faze always think the best of people, and she was determined to look on the bright side. Even if Mrs Trottle had spoilt Raymond a little, there would be time to put that right when he came to the island. When children behave badly, it is nearly always the fault of those who bring them up. There he is, whispered Ben, over there by the window. There was a long pause. You're sure, asked Cor, there can be no mistake? I'm sure, said Ben. He then slipped away from the rescuers, were left to study the boy they had come so far to find. He looks healthy, said Gherkintrude, trying to make the best of things. And well washed, agreed the wizard. Um, I imagine there would be no mould behind his ears. Odd didn't say anything. She still carried the suitcase, holding it out flat like a tray, and had been in a very nasty temper since she discovered that Ben was not the prince. What surprised him most was how like his supposed mother, Raymond Trottle, looked. They both had the same fat faces, the same podgy noses, the same round, pale eyes. They knew, of course, that dogs often grow to be their, like their owners, so perhaps it was understandable that Raymond, who had lived with the Trottle since he was three months old, should look like the woman who had stolen him. It was odd all the same. The visitors had looked forward very much to having lunch in a posh restaurant, but the hour that followed was one of the saddest of their lives. They found a table behind a potted palm from which they could watch the trottles without being noticed, and what they saw got worse and worse and worse. 
Raymond's shrimps had arrived and he was pushing them away with a scowl. I don't want them, said Raymond. They're the wrong ones. I want bigger ones. As far as Gertie was concerned, there was no such thing as a wrong shrimp or a right shrimp. All shrimps were her friends and she would have died rather than eat one. But she felt dreadfully sorry for the waitress. The bigger ones are prawns, sir, I'm afraid. We don't have any today. Don't have any prawns, said Mrs Trotkel in a loud voice. Don't have any prawns in the most expensive restaurant in London. The waitress had been on her feet all day. Her little girl was ill at home and she kept her temper. If you'd just try them, sir, she begged Raymond, but he wouldn't. The dish was taken away and Raymond decided to start with soup. Only not with any bits in it, he shouted out after the waitress. I don't eat bits. Poor Gerky's kind round face was growing paler and paler. The islanders had ordered salad and nut cutlets, but she was so sensitive that she could hear the lamb chops screaming on the neighbouring tables, and the poor stiff legs of dead, dead pheasants sticking up from people's plates made her want to cry. Raymond's soup came, and it did have bits in it, a few leaves of fresh parsley. I thought I asked for clear soup, said Mrs Trottle. Really, I find it quite extraordinary that you cannot bring us what we want. The rescues had been up all night. They were not only sad, they were tired, and because of this, they forgot themselves a little. When their nut cutlets came, they, they were too hard for the wizard's teeth, and he should have mashed them up with his fork. Of course he should. Instead, he mumbled something, and in a second, the cutlets had turned to liquid. Fortunately, no one saw, and the liquidising spell is nothing to write for home about. It was used by wizards in the olden days to turn their enemies' bones to jelly. But it was embarrassing when they were trying so hard to be ordinary. And then the sweet peas in Gertrude Trude's hat started to put down tendrils without being told, so that it's shield from the sight of the prince fishing with his fingers in the soup. The trottles roast pork came next, and the kind waitress had managed to persuade the chef to put a helping of Yorkshire pudding on Raymond's plate, though everyone who knows anything about food knows that Yorkshire pudding belongs to beef and not to pork. Raymond stared at the plate out of his round, pale eyes. I don't want roast potatoes, he said. I want chips. Roast potatoes are boring. Now, Raymond, dear, began his mother, I want chips. This is supposed to be my treat, and it isn't a treat if I can't have chips. Odge had behaved quite well so far. She glared, she ground her teeth, but she'd gone on eating her lunch. Now, though, she began to have thoughts, and the thoughts were about her sisters, and in particular about the older sister, who was better than anyone on the island at ill-wishing pigs. Ill-wishing things is not all that difficult. Which doctors do it when they send bad thoughts to people that make them sick? Sometimes you can do it when you will, will someone not to score a goal at football and they don't. Odge had never wanted to ill-wish pigs because she liked animals, but she had sometimes wanted to ill-wish people. And now, more than anything in the world, she wanted to ill-wish Raymond Trottle. But she didn't. The one thing she wasn't sure, if she could, and anyway, she had promised to behave like the girls at St. Agnes, whose uniform she wore. I want a knickerbocker glory next, said Raymond. The kind with pink ice cream, green ice cream, and jelly and peaches and raspberry juice and nuts. <laughs> the waitress went away and returned with Mrs. Trottle's caramel pudding and the knickerbocker glory in a tall glass. It was an absolutely marvellous one. Just to look at it made Odge's mouth water. Raymond picked up a spoon and put it down again. It hasn't got an umbrella on top, he wailed. I always have a plastic umbrella on top. I won't eat it unless I have a... Uh, eat, yow. What's happened? I didn't touch it. I didn't, I didn't. He was telling the truth, for once. But nobody believed him, for the knickerbocker glory had done a somersault and landed face down on the table, so that the three kinds of ice cream, the jelly, the tin peaches and the raspberry juice were running down Raymond's trousers, into his socks, across his flashy shoes. Odge had not ill-wished Raymond's trottle. She had been very good and held herself in, but not completely. She had ill-wished the knickerbocker glory. That's the end of the chapter.